Hello fellow 602 students. This is Bram with a reflection on the stuff that I took from this year that is going to have the biggest impact on my career as an instructional designer. Um, most connected to that is a conversation that we had in class yesterday with Nish Sonwalker. So um, I'm going to go into that now. Uh, this is using Screencast-O-Matic which only gives me 15 minutes and hopefully I won't even use that much time up. So uh, when you're talking to Nish, he was uh, mentioning that uh, we have a problem with MOOCs uh, where they don't adapt to users and I'd asked him whether he was talking about the user interface or whether he was talking about the learning path or both and he said both and he mentioned the concept of a Markovian analysis which would be looking at what users do and revealing um, patterns and giving you ways to access things. So for example if you have a bunch of people who are students in a class and they're following you on Twitter you could have a program that perhaps uh, revealed those people and showed what their most recent twi tweets were or what content they just recently done on WordPress and instead of you having to go and check each site you have it all in one place so you spend less time and you can see patterns revealed for yourself like oh wow five of my friends just posted about this maybe I should check it out. Now, I have been a Drupal developer since 2005, and this matched an idea that I'd had and I'd recently shared at a conference <coughs> Excuse me, about how we could develop new learning management systems like Blackboard, which would have a user dashboard page when you first log in. Da Blackboard is kind of getting to that with that little thing on the right-hand side, but it's not really very well executed yet. And the idea was that a, Drupal, a user dashboard page would reveal these kinds of things and also reveal the tools that you were using based on the courses that you were signed up for. So this is two levels of adapt adaptivity or adaptation. One, adapting to the people in your personal learning network and two, adapting to the courses that you're taking to give you access to content and tools. So um, in a Markovian model, uh, you, Markov come up with this way of saying there's events and these events have change and you know, chains of, of events and if you look at how often they occur you can then create a an, an output or an image that could click to get you to the content and get the, to the users and see what patterns are happening. It's all about recognizing and responding to patterns when you're dealing with a CMOOC because patterns are emerging as people participate. They're not anything you can bring from a past MOOC to a current MOOC in a CMOOC. So Drupal, which is the content management system that I'm an expert in, um, has all these different community contributed code modules that handle kinds of dashboards. And um, because it's free, if you have a Drupal site, you can go and grab one of these modules, put it on your site, see what it does, make changes to it, customize what it looks like, and maybe even hire the developers to do special work for you. Um, obviously Coursera cost a whole lot to make and there was a lot of big players paying for it. Penn State actually is using Drupal for its e-learning platform um, and worth checking out. Theirs is called ELMS. Anyway, the contributed module that people talked about at that conference I was at that seemed to be the best match for making the dashboards I talked about is called Homebox. In this image you can see that there's um, recent content made by whoever the user is default shortcuts the user puts links to places menu links of different users that are in the network recent comments made this is really really simple I'm going to show you how it gets more complex so Drupal which is you know the website for Drupal adopted Homebox and so when I go to log into Drupal I see this dashboard it shows me my recent posts and what comments have been made on them it shows me uh, general news for things that I've subscribed to um, and so I've subscribed to Planet Drupal and that's why I get to see this particular box um, links to people who've contributed to stuff that I care about and then a little search box that's a pretty handy thing um, you could imagine having a dashboard that you could customize where you're just like you're doing with TweetDeck and saying I want to search for these things and put that in this box and I want to connect to this social platform and put that in this box you could give users the opportunity to say I want to look for these things here I want to add things there I want this box here that box there um, so it starts to look more like uh, the old iGoogle or uh, NetVibes you know those personal dashboards but the difference is with iGoogle and Google and NetVibes, those dashboards are revealing stuff on the internet, whereas these dashboards are revealing stuff on the intranet, stuff that happens within the system that you're working with, as well as the internet. 
So it's bringing together both the links within your learning management system and the links outside depending on what social connection system you want to bring in like Twitter or WordPress. Now that last one looked pretty horrifying but you could imagine this being a sort of user-friendly dashboard where you log in and you can make the different kinds of things you like to make, see which of the people in your personal network are online, see if there's new people in any of the groups you're part of, get reports on different kinds of activity. Now these links at the below are all uh, about how to use Drupal to build these kinds of dashboards and if you want to pause this and grab those, um, it's a lot of typing for you, I'm sorry, but that's a thing you could do. Now I'm going to switch topics. Um, the other thing I'm really interested in is how you do instructional design to support linking outside learning management systems and into the world. Um, because I think that uh, very often if professors do this at all, they do it in a kind of for example method where you, it's not really sincere. Um, they'll say make blogs, but then they won't comment on the blogs and they won't bring the content of the blogs back into the class. So you end up going, oh good, good I can make a blog but what necessarily happens from that. So I'm talking about actually designing the class responsively around student activity taking place within and without the LMS. So um, just to summarize the stuff of the connectivism uh, lecture that we got yesterday, which was really awesome, um, just like neurons in your brain connect when you learn stuff, so people connect when they learn stuff together. This image actually was used yesterday. and. Uh, when you look at how learning happens in the brain, there's different kinds of learning which activate different kinds of the brain. And similarly, if you go to different kinds of social learning sites or social learning networks or knowledge creation sites, they're going to do give different kinds of things as well. And my uh, idea, which is not anything particularly amazing, is that courses should not go, oh, everybody use Twitter, we'll use Twitter, everybody use WordPress, we'll use WordPress, but rather choose the networks and the tools and the data sources that are appropriate to the topic under study so that you aren't quite so overwhelmed with so many things. Stephen Downs, one of the developers of uh, connectivism, um, is talking about that it's neurons or people, but how do you adjust the strength of connections to adapt to what it is that you're learning? Um, we know that Blackboard is not connectivist. It's just not designed to help people do a whole lot of stuff. It's more designed to uh, get students to know what they're supposed to do based on what their teachers are telling them and if the students learn how to use that right then they can get good grades. But that's about the best you can say about Blackboard right now. Um, a lot of people have made mind maps about connectivism. and If you go and you Google connectivism mind map you'll see them. They look kind of like this they kind of put the person at the center and then they link all the different things that that person connects to. And these get a little bit overwhelming when you look at them. And, um, a lot of these were made by Walden University, which is a for-profit college that has an instructional design program. I actually audited a course with them to see what it was like and found it fairly overwhelming and awful. But um, this person is mapping their personal learning network, they're mapping their school learning environment, they're mapping the Web 2.0 tools they like, the data sources they like to go to, their personal learning patterns, how they like to connect with people, their personal experience and what that brings to how they work in a MOOC, and their extended networks. Um, I'm saying that putting yourself at the center makes this too complicated, but instead if you put, well, somebody else puts connectivism in the center and they're trying to come up with a description about what connectivist patterns look like together. They say if you've got your tools, you've got your learning process, you've got your sources, you've got your learning patterns, and you've got your network of people, that develops a connectivist learning strategy. Um, and I could have clicked on these one by one and seen them. Uh, but I'm going to say that if you put the community of practice at the center, and then you articulate the lines that go to these various elements we just talked about for each individual course, this is a way of helping professors visualize what they can do by going outside of the learning management system that they're using. So you're picking a topic, you say, okay, what are the online networks that, are, that use that topic? Who are the experts in that um, network? Um, how do they decide on what's true? And so what patterns should students use to decide on what's true? What data sources reflect what people are thinking there? The real data sources, not just Googled stuff. Thank you, Dr. Manning, for me not to, reminding me never to Google again. Um, and finding online programs that people use in that field, uh, you know, software that students can have access to without downloading if possible, so they use the tools of the field. 
and then use them in the ways that experts participate in the network. Um, so this is a diagram I put together in which this stuff in the center horizontal part are the parts that define a connectivist learning activity and based on those you then design your instructional strategy and your technological strategy and this kind of marries into what Dr. Nish Walker talked about that you've got an adaptive instructional strategy and you've got an adaptive technology strategy adapting to the learner and to the topic of the MOOC. I had taken a jazz improvisation MOOC with uh, Gary Burton who it turns out Dr. Manning's husband has done work for which is amazing and it was an incredible activity. It was within Coursera but Coursera sent people outside to do other stuff and by doing that it made it more of a C MOOC than they'd intended. Um, and I had another student in my 640 class develop a course for he dental hygienists using my model and we verified that it actually can be used and it can work. Um, so that's my presentation for you. Thank you very much for listening.